Good morning, Calvary Bible Church. How are you? Thanks for welcoming me into your congregation. Um, my name is Jim Wallace. I've been uh, working in Los Angeles County for, by the way, is this an amazing worship team or what? Just amazing. I don't get a chance often to see an orchestra on the stage when I work around the country. You know, a lot of churches have different forms of worship. It just was kind of refreshing to, to see the power of so many people. I mean, how many people, I think there's as many people on the stage as there are in the audience for crying out loud. <laughs> Pretty impressive. All right, I want to share with you some things I've learned over the last 25 years of working in Los Angeles County. I've spent the last 15 or so working nothing but cold case murders. These are just unsolved homicides. There's no statute of limitations on a homicide, so we can go back and work these years later. We can work them 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later. My cases are all in that range of, say, 1979 to 1988, 1990, right around that range. And you learn things when you're working cases for which you don't have sometimes any living eyewitnesses who can testify. I often do have eyewitnesses who can testify, but in some of these cases, the eyewitness is no longer with us, and the person who first interviewed the eyewitness is no longer with us. So I have a report, but no access to the writer or the person they're writing about. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like the Gospels, right? An event in the distant past, no ex access to the living eyewitnesses. I can't make the case forensically. So a lot of the skill set that I possessed as an investigator, I applied to my investigation of Christianity. I was about 35 before I ever bought a Bible. And I looked at it and I thought, okay, I wasn't sure what to expect. Uh, and I read through the Gospels, and I want to share with you this morning some of the stuff I've learned. My son was raised in the church. He's not like me. I was not raised around any Christians. My son is doing the same job that I was doing for years. His name is also Jim Wallace because that's what we name everybody. <laughs> I don't care who you are. We have three names. My name is James Warner Wallace. My dad's name is James David. Um, his name is James David. I have another son named David. <laughs> I feel stupid even saying it, really, to be honest with you. His name is David Warner Wallace. Oh, gosh. So we stopped right there because we couldn't figure out any other combinations of those three names. <laughs> then I had two daughters. And uh, so this guy's doing the same job that I did for years before him. He's wearing the same uniform, same name tag. Although he calls himself Jimmy because I was Jimmy until this kid was born because my dad was Jim. So we've been doing the same work at the same agency for 56 years now, and you learn a few things when you do that. Some are good, some are bad. Some things help you, some things don't. Some things you kind of, kind of carry uh, deeply, some things you hold with an open hand. Well, I'm going to send you a bunch of stuff. I, I tell you, when I was an atheist, I was always suspicious of, of, of Christians who were selling stuff, right? That's why he's really here. He's selling a book. Well, my books didn't make it to this event, okay? Isn't that awesome? Because I thought, I felt that way, and then, of course, God was laughing at me because eventually I became the Christian who was selling something, right? So the good thing about this is, is that I typically don't care if I sell a single book because I hate selling books, but I do like teaching people the truth, and we're going to send you everything from today from a website called coldcasechristianity.com. So everything we talk about today, if you like to take notes, take notes. You don't have to, though, because I'm going to send you the PDF files about everything we talk about today. I'm going to send you the video, the longer video, because we're going to do about three quarters of it today. I'm going to send you the MP3 so you can listen to it in your car. I'm going to send you that stuff because it's more important for you to know the truth than to be able to buy it from me. Make sense? I also have a free uh, phone app that you can download where you can read everything that's on our website, and including watching the video of what we're going to talk about today. It's available to watch from the phone for free, and you can reach me by social media on just about every platform there is, okay? About a year ago, I was asked to do a scene in a movie called God's Not Dead 2. And I was kind of reluctant at first, but I did it. And in this movie, they gave me six minutes to make a case for the reliability of Scripture. It's not a lot of time. Typically, it's hard to make a case in just six minutes, right? I mean, you have to know a lot more to figure out which six minutes you're going to edit in. And that was my problem, is how do I make this case briefly? You might have the same problem in dealing with your own friends and family members. How do I make the case for what I believe? And by the way, you might be inclined to say, well, I just know it's true. And I'm going to go a little bit longer. I'm going to add this piece to today, the second one. So you try to make times very important in the first service. You've got to be right, right? Because the second service is coming. But you're now in the second service, and there's no third service. So guess what? <laughs> you're stuck here with me for a little while. 
No, but I typically will ask, why are you guys Christians? I get the same three answers everywhere I go. I'm just going to tell you what they are. The most popular answer I get is, I was raised in the church. That is the number one reason why most people believe anything, because their parents did. The second answer I get is, well, I've had some experience that confirmed for me that Christianity was true. I saw a miracle occur. I have, God has been speaking to me about things. Whatever, you've had some experience that demonstrates for you that Christianity is true. The third answer is kind of similar to the second answer. I used to be a jerk, then I met Jesus. I'm not so much a jerk anymore. He changed my life. Those are good answers. But I recognize as a family of atheists, my dad, he's been married twice. His second wife is Mormon. My half-brothers and sisters are all LDS. They're all Mormons. Six. I have three brothers and three sisters. And if you ask them, why are you a Mormon? Guess what they say? Same three answers in the same order. As a matter of fact, those are the top three answers for Muslims. The top three answers for Buddhists, Hindus. Why do our answers sound like theirs? We don't think their system is true. If that's the case, why do your answers sound like theirs? I think we need better answers. So what I want to do is try to walk through some of that for you. We actually, by the way, we do have better answers, even if we're not prepared to give them. There are better answers out there. So I want to teach you about the nature of evidence from this book I wrote called Cold Case Christianity. Ready? There are two forms of evidence that we use in criminal trials, only two, direct evidence and indirect evidence, okay? That's it. That's the only two forms of evidence on the planet. Direct evidence is of one kind, eyewitness testimony. If you don't have an eyewitness, you don't have a direct evidence case. Oh, DNA, indirect evidence. Fingerprints, indirect evidence. Really? Yeah. Behaviors that you saw, indirect evidence. Statements, indirect evidence. Unless you have a witness who can say, I saw him do it and I'm going to identify him, you can't make it with just direct evidence. You have to use indirect evidence. There's another word for that. It's called circumstantial evidence. Don't you hate that word? Haven't you heard people say, oh, they don't have a very good case. It's entirely circumstantial. They just have a circumstantial case. It's just a circumstantial case. How many times have you heard that? I hate that. I'm going to show you why circumstantial cases are incredibly powerful. By the way, all of my cases are circumstantial cases. I don't have a direct... That's why they're cold. If there was somebody who saw it 30 years ago, it would have got solved 30 years ago. So I'll do a case with you, okay? This guy. This guy's been accused of killing his girlfriend. Now, I know this projector is not all that bright, but he does have feet, okay? <laughs> he's not hovering there. He's got feet. And he's accused of killing his girlfriend with that baseball bat. Now, we're going to make this case one of two ways. If we make it with direct evidence, we're going to need an eyewitness. Somebody who can say that, that they saw him do it. Maybe a neighbor who says, yeah, I heard the argument, looked across the street, and my neighbor, who's a wonderful lady, she was being assaulted by her boyfriend. He punched her several times. She went to the floor. He got a bat out. He beat her with it mercilessly, ran to a car, and drove off. Really? You saw that whole thing? Yep. Do you know who that guy is? Oh, yeah. Oh, you know the killer? Oh, yeah. How do you know him? Well, he grew up in the same neighborhood as this girl I know, the neighbor, the victim. They've been dating since they were this high. And, and listen, we, we do all kinds of stuff together. I mean, we're like a big family in this neighborhood. We do block parties and Fourth of July and Thanksgiving. As a matter of fact, this guy was wearing the shirt that I gave him for Christmas two years ago. Okay, that's a good witness, okay? <laughs> right? Because let's face it, she can not only identify him, she's, he's wearing the clothes that she gave him. That's not bad. If she survives under cross-examination, unless the defense attorney can find something wrong with her, we can make this entire case on the basis of one piece of evidence, her eyewitness testimony, and that would be what a direct evidence case looks like. Are we clear? Let's change it. What if she didn't give him a shirt that he wore for Christmas? What if he's wearing a different shirt? And what if he's got a mask on his head so she can't even identify him facially? All she can see now, whoever the killer is, he's about the right height and weight as the boyfriend that I know. Would you be willing to convict this guy based on that? Well, how about if we do this? Let's go over and talk to him. We'll do this indirectly, since we can't do it with a direct witness. We'll do it indirectly. Let's knock on his door. Hey, what were you doing yesterday, dude? The day of the murder. What were you doing? Oh, I was drinking with two of my friends. Really? What are your buddies' names? We go interview his friends. They say, no, he was not with us. We haven't seen that guy in weeks. He's lying. So now we got a guy who fits the general build, and he's lying about his alibi. Well, let's do a little more. 
At the search warrant, we also discover in his closet, he's got a baseball bat. And the baseball bat is all beat up and nicked up and dinged up in this area here. Well, I think, okay, let's do a little biological test to see if there's any blood or tissue on that hair. Nope, it's clean because he has soaked his baseball bat in bleach. How many of you have got a baseball bat? Raise your hand. How many of you have got a bleached baseball bat? Raise your hand. (laughs) Any suspects in the room here? I don't think so, right? Who does that unless, of course, you're trying to hide evidence? So now I've got a bleached baseball bat, a B.O. alibi, and he fits the general description. How many of you think he's our guy right now? Raise your hand. A few of you, right? I always say this because I do these talks all over the country, that in California, I can never get anyone to raise their hand. I don't care what I do. Right? I'm in California. And in Texas, he's already convicted on death row. (laughs) Right? So we have this extreme edge, right, in between these two kinds of thinking. But you're right in the middle, which is good. Now, also we find the search warrant a pair of Levi's. Now, he was, the killer was seen wearing Levi's, and these Levi's we find, they match the description. They are dirty, but not at the knees. At the knees, they're clean, and they are glowing when we expose them to luma. We spray luminol on certain surfaces, and then we can put uh, luminescent lights, and we can see they will glow if uh, certain body fluids are present, blood is present, uh, if certain detergents are used. And these are glowing at the knees, but if we test them for biological material. It's not biological. It appears to be that he has successfully cleaned something off the knees, but left the residue of the detergent. Hmm. What is he cleaning off of his knees? Now, they're dirty everywhere else. If he wanted to clean the entire pair of dirty pants, just throw them in the washer. No, he's spot cleaning something other than dirt off of his knees. Bleached bat, B.O. alibi fits the general description. No sign of forced entry. Whoever got in this house did not have to knock down a door or break a window to get in. That means they were either let in voluntarily, which, of course, if he's the boyfriend, she would have let him in, or they had a key. And of the three people who had a key, he was one of those three. So he would explain why there's no forced entry. And he will tell you in an interview that he's had an up and down, rocky, roller coaster relationship with this girl. Not always good. He's smacked her a number of times, and he feels bad about it. He admits that he smacked her on the day of the actual murder. He says this is just part of his nature, and she understands him. She always forgives him, and the cycle repeats. But he says on the day of the murder, it was exceptionally bad because he found out on that day that she was cheating on him. He says, I I smacked her pretty good. I even threatened to kill her in front of her friends. I'll admit that, but I did not kill her. How many of you feel good about this guy right now? Raise your hand. Don't be afraid. Raise your hand. We'll make fun of you. Raise your hand. How many of you think he's our guy? Raise your hand. How many dads here think if that's your daughter, I want this guy in jail right now? (laughs) Raise your hand. I get it. Okay. Okay. Uh, The boots that the uh, witness saw him wearing when he ran out were unusual. They had a leather band on the side of the boot, on the outside side. You do some research, only one manufacturer makes a boot like that. They only sell it in one place, anywhere in the county. They don't sell very many of these, maybe 30 pairs in the last two years. But who do you think's got one of these pairs of boots in his closet? Our guy. So now we have a 1 in 30 relationship to these boots. He's got a one in three relationship to the entry. What are the odds that one of these three is also one of those 30? Do you see the problem here? And when we get to do that search warrant, we're knocking on that door, he's writing a note. We know he's writing a note because it's still on the counter. And that note is a suicide note because he says in that note that yesterday, the day of the murder, he did something so horrific that he cannot forgive himself. He lost his temper. He can't take it back. He wishes he didn't do that. He's now changed history. He's changed his own future. He can't not even live with himself. But you got there a little bit too soon. The note is unfinished. And nowhere in the note does he say that the terrible thing he did was kill his girlfriend. Finally, the witness says when he drove out of the, uh, uh, off the location, he was in an unusual car, a car that she recognized. What kind of car was it? Well, it's like an early 70s canary yellow Volkswagen Carmen Ghia. You guys don't have a lot of Volkswagen Carmen Ghias, I'm betting, here in Michigan. Am I right? Did you realize that Volkswagen is the number one selling car in the world last year? Did you guys know that? Is that crazy? It's true. First time in many years. But there's still not a lot of Carmen Gias on the road. I do a DMV search, a DMV search for Carmen Gias. There's like three or four operational anywhere in the county. And we don't know what color they are because DMV doesn't say that. But when we go do the search warrant at his house and we lift his garage door, what do you think he's got in his garage? 
He's got himself a 1972 Canary Yellow Carmen Ghia. Now, at this point, I think we could uh, ask this question. Jim, isn't it possible, though, he's still innocent? Of course it is. Why? Because if you ask me, isn't it possible, about any question, I'll always say yes. Isn't it possible we're all still sleeping right now? We're dreaming this entire service? Yes. Isn't it possible this entire thing is a computer simulation? Yes. Isn't it possible we're all living in the matrix right now? We just haven't taken the pill yet? Yes. All of those things are possible. But that's not what counts in criminal trials. It's not beyond a possible doubt. You'd never convict anybody. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. We're looking for not what's possible. We're looking for what's reasonable. And I get it. I mean, I can say, well, Jim, isn't it possible that, that you know, um, I'm going to go back here. That this is explained some other way. Isn't it possible I can explain the bat some other way? Isn't it possible I can explain the pants some other way? Yes, of course. There can be unrelated causes. Eight amazingly coincidental unrelated causes that make him look guilty when he's not. That's possible. But it's not reasonable. The more reasonable inference is that he is the one common causal agent that has created this mess, that is the cause of all of this, that unifies all of this. That's the far more reason. Look, he's either incredibly unlucky or incredibly guilty. Which is more reasonable? This is what we call a circumstantial or indirect evidence case. This is every case I work. We've got other cold case investigators sitting right here in this, in this, in this um, congregation. This is probably every case they work too. In the end, I drew it this way in cold case Christianity. I, I'm actually, I came out of the arts before I became a, uh, a police officer. I, I, was, uh, I have a bachelor's degree in design and then a master's degree in architecture from, uh, from, from UCLA. We're all Bruins in our family, right? I went to UCLA. Uh, by the way, we won yesterday. Did you see that? Five touchdowns, Josh Rosen. Anyway, did I say that? I, just kind of, I was thinking it. Did it come out? I don't know. But, but USC also won, and we hate USC. We hate USC. I have one son who's a police officer, but my other son, David, he's in, uh, in, right now he's in residency as an anesthesiologist, right? Well, he went to med school where? USC. <laughs> so we're Bruins. He is a communist, okay? Just so you know. <laughs> So when we do these cases in front of a jury, we don't do them with just eight pieces of evidence. We do them with 80 pieces of evidence, 180 pieces of evidence. I call this death by a thousand paper cuts. Yeah, and any one of these little things may not seem like much, but you get enough paper cuts, hmm, you're going to bleed out. So I mean, the problem here is how do we amass a large case? Now, I love these kinds of cases more than direct evidence cases because jurors are instructed by judges to treat circumstantial evidence the same way they treat direct evidence. Did you know that? Here's the jury instruction in California. Both direct and circumstantial evidence are acceptable types of evidence. Neither is entitled to any greater weight than the other. So stop calling it just a circumstantial case. We've never lost one of these cases. These are powerful ways to make cases. Why do I say that? Because now I want to turn this toward Christianity. Well, Jim, isn't the case for Christianity built on the eyewitness testimony in the Gospels? Yes, but I learned a long time ago, do, I'd rather have an indirect case because direct witnesses lie all the time. How do I know the Gospel authors aren't lying? Well, I've learned a long time ago, I don't trust eyewitnesses. I test eyewitnesses. If you test them and they pass the test, that's different. Well, then you can trust them. But you've got to pass the test in order to be trusted. What's the test? Well, we have a 14 questionnaire, 14 questions we uh, give jurors to help them evaluate eyewitnesses in jury trials. They kind of come down to these four broad categories. Now, I'm going to make it easier for you. Look at it as four simple words. If the person was really present to see what it is he said he saw, was he really there? Two, can he be corroborated in some way? Three, has he changed his story over time or has he been honest and accurate? And four, does he have a bias? So let's just go with simple words. Are they present, verified, accurate, and biased? If they pass the test in these four categories, you're supposed to trust them. Well, as an investigator at the age of 35 who had no horse in the race, no desire for Christianity to be true, my wife was more interested than I was, but she was also not a believer. I decided to test the gospel authors. Here's what I found. I'll do three of the four with you. You ready? And by the way, if I did all four, we'd be here about 17 hours. So if you needed proof that there is a God, I just gave it to you. I could stay with you for 17 hours, but I'm not going to. Therefore, there is a God. Okay? In case you were wondering. 
Here's the first test. Were they really there? Here's a guy who was accused of being there at a murder of actually killing a 10-year-old girl in 1972 on Thanksgiving Day while her parents were cooking dinner. Horrific crime. He was arrested. He confessed to all of it. It's about a thousand page transcript. I've read it cover to cover. It's pretty bad. It's everything he did to this poor girl, then how he killed her, then finally what he did with the body. And it is not a good read. None of it's true. He wasn't even there. But the officers sadly gave him just enough information in every question to let him craft a story that seemed plausible at first. And then as they gave him a little bit more, he shaped his story to fit what his expectations were. He is not a killer. He is no longer on the case. He's now passed away. This case is still open. You can't be the killer if you weren't there. He wasn't there. But you also can't be an eyewitness if you weren't there. And this is what I thought was the case with the Gospels. Look, you have this event called the ministry of Jesus. It's recorded in the Gospels. Now, we're a little bit off the screen, so just bear with me. And then you have a church council that where allegedly people came together and said, well, which Gospel accounts can we trust to put in the canon of Scripture? Really? There's 330 years between those two dates. That's a long time. If the Gospels were written late in history, over here somewhere, then you cannot trust them as eyewitness accounts. They weren't there. The eyewitnesses have been dead. By the way, if you want to lie about Jesus, let me tell you how you do it. You wait till everyone who knew Jesus is dead. Then you can say anything you want about Jesus. Who's going to know? If you're going to write it early, though, when people who knew Jesus were still alive, and in the region where he was lit, then you got to, it's, it's tougher, right? It's tougher to lie if you're going to write it early. So I needed to know. There are skeptics out there who are writing books, tons of books, and these are very well-read skeptics. I mean, these, these guys sell millions of books. Bart Ehrman is about as famous as any skeptic gets on biblical literature. And he's PhD trained as a biblical um, uh, scholar out of Princeton. He teaches the Bible department at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Yet he's not a Christian, he's an atheist. He thinks this has been changed over time, and he thinks that this was written really late, that nobody who was actually alive wrote the Gospels. These are late stories. If people like this are right, then we got a problem because it can't even pass the first test. On the other hand, if they're written over here, or really if they're written over here, well, then we have good confidence to at least know they passed the first test. They could still be lies, but they're early lies, and those are harder to make. Make sense? So how do we know when it was written? It's actually written over here. I'm going to show you evidentially with some circumstantial evidence. You ready? There's a book by Luke called the book of Acts, right? Luke was a witness during the book of Acts. He was a friend of Paul. He even slips into first person in the book of Acts when he's writing it. But he was not a witness to Jesus. He interviewed the witnesses who knew Jesus because he knew those people because they were hanging out in the book of Acts together. Make sense? Nowhere in the book of Acts does Luke ever mention the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Why? Why wouldn't he mention it? It happened in 70 AD, so it's still relatively early in history. You could mention it. After all, Jesus predicted it. You won't mention what he predicted. Why wouldn't you? It makes him look like he's an accurate predictor. Not only that, he doesn't mention the siege of Jerusalem that happened about a year or two before that. The entire city barricaded, blockaded by the Roman soldiers. They were so starving. They were starving. The city stopped all supplies coming in or going out. People tried to escape. They crucified them on the road out of Jerusalem. It was so bad that Josephus, the historian, the Jewish historian says that as people came in, the Roman guards came in, they discovered that children had died and that some parents were eating their kids to stay alive. That's worth mentioning. Yet it's missing from the book of Acts. If you're writing a history of New York City and you don't put in the Twin Tower attack, Someone's going to say, why would that be missing from your history of New York City? Not only that, Paul is still alive at the end of the book of Acts. We know when he dies, he dies in the 60s. Why not mention how he dies? He's an important guy. Peter, you don't mention how he dies. He's an important... James, the brother of Jesus, is probably the biggest leader in the early church. He is leading the council in Acts 15. No mention of his death? We know when he died, died in 61. Oh yeah, well, you know, Luke, he mentions the death of, of Stephen... So what? Why would you mention the death of James in 44? The James, the brother of John, not the brother of Jesus. Luke mentions that death. Why would you mention these minor players but leave out the three most important players? Well, if this hasn't happened yet, you can't write about it. So let's test this. What if Acts is written before any of this happens? Let's put it just one year prior. 
I think it could be easily or earlier, but I'm going to put it one year prior just to be conservative. Now let's test it. Luke wrote two books. Did you know that? This is not a trick question. What's the other book that Luke wrote? <laughs> Students, what is it? They passed the test. <laughs> All right, which one did he write first? Luke or Acts? Which one? Good job. Well taught. Very good. Luke, he writes first. We know that because he tells us that in the first verse of Acts. He said, hey, Theophilus, my former book, where I talk about everything that Jesus did and before he was ascended, that's the gospel of Luke. Okay, got it. Now, I'll show you some evidence that I think will help us date Luke. I date Luke at 53. I'm going to show you why. At 63, we have a letter from Paul to Timothy. And in this letter, he says, Timothy, take care of your church leaders. They deserve to be compensated. I know this because my Bible tells me so. Oh, really? What is Paul using as a Bible as early as 63? He's going to tell you right now. The scripture says, he says, two verses he quotes, do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. That is from Deuteronomy. This verse, though, is not from the Old Testament. That verse, the worker deserves his wages, is a New Testament verse. He's using a, t a verse from the Old Testament, a verse from the New Testament to make his case. But that means that the New Testament has to be available to him. He is quoting the Gospel of Luke. Now, I said 53. This is at 63. Here's why. Another letter he wrote to the church in Corinth trying to remind them how to properly do the Lord's Supper. He planted this church probably two years earlier. By this time, they're already doing the Lord's Supper wrong. They're getting drunk before the Lord's Supper. He says, hey, time out. Go back to the way I taught you. I didn't teach you that way. And he reminds them of the way he taught them earlier. And he uses one passage about the Lord's Supper to do it. It's the only passage in all of Scripture that sounds anything like that because he is once again quoting from the Gospel of Luke. A much larger piece of Luke. But that means you've got to have Luke available to quote from it. And he's saying, I taught you this two years earlier. How early is Luke? Early. Let's go to the first verse of Luke. He's talking to Theophilus here. He wrote both books to Theophilus. At one time, these two manuscripts were together, a Luke Acts. He says, therefore, since I myself, remember, he's not an eyewitness in the gospel of Luke. He's an eyewitness in the book of Acts. But he's speaking to the eyewitnesses for the gospel of Luke. And he says, therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now, cops, we pin on optional words. Words you could have chosen not to use. And I always start with my daughter. This drives my daughters crazy, okay? I'll say, hey, because my daughter Mia, she's going to be the best cop of all of us. She'll be the best cop. She's right now in the Marine Corps stationed in St. Louis, right? Uh, Leonard Wood, just uh, south of St. Louis. And she's an MP. So I guarantee you she'll be the best cop. You know why? Because she's a great liar. Oh, my gosh. I tell her all the time, you will spot a lie coming. You know why? Because you could have told that lie. Seriously, she's a great liar. I always laugh about it now because she's out of the house, right? But I'm telling you, when she was with me, I was doing nuts. And I used to say, dude, before you say anything, remember, I'm going to hold every word you say against you. Go ahead. <laughs> and she'd say, well, I said, oh, hang on. Remember also, I'm going to hold every word you could have chosen to use but chose not to use. I'm going to hold those words against you too. Now go ahead. She just confesses at that point, right? Because what's the point? You can't get it, you know, if you're going to judge every word... That's what we do in this thing called forensic statement analysis. We're judging these optional words. They're typically adjectives and adverbs. Let me tell you why that works in Scripture. Looking at this verse, there are some optional words. Here's the first one. He says, I'm going to carefully investigate this. Really? Well, how else would you investigate it? Do I want a sloppy investigation? Why do you think you need to tell me this is carefully investigated? Sometimes when you see a don't park sign, it's because people have been parking there. <laughs> So you put a don't park here. That just tells me people have been parking there. Well, why do I say this? Because it appears to be there is an uncareful or less careful version of the Jesus story out there. He's drawing his as a contrast. What would that be? What's the other early story of Jesus? It's Mark. Compare Mark to Luke. Big difference, right? Almost two to one in terms of volume and detail. Luke is very careful. Not only that, he uses this uh, optional word as a title, most excellent. That's a title given to very few people in local cities. Probably Theophilus is somebody important. But we don't know. 
Here's another optional word. Orderly. It means correct chronological order. Why in the world would you have to tell me that your history of Jesus is in the right historical order? Isn't that what histories are? So why is he saying that? Well, if there's another early history of Jesus that's not in the right order, there is. It's called the Gospel of Mark. Have you ever compared Mark to Luke? The events don't line up in the same order. Well, why is that? Because Papias, a bishop in the first century, said that Mark wrote his account at the feet of Peter as Peter was teaching in Rome. Peter often taught in themes, not in chronological order. So Papias says that Mark's account is, according to this ancient document, accurate, if not orderly. He uses the exact same Greek word. So Papias says that Mark's is not orderly. And who do you think Luke quotes word for word more than any other source? Mark. Only he's now got it in the right order. But that means that Mark's account has to be first. Because he's quoting it. Which he is. Check it out for yourselves. But that means that Mark's account is pretty early. I didn't say this in the first service. I'm just going to say it right now. Not all memories are created equal. You mean you tell me somebody could come in 30 years later and tell you some story from 30 years ago and you're going to believe it? That's a big time span here. Even if it's 20 years, you're going to be, you think you could trust someone's account from 20 years earlier? Uh, yeah, we do that for a living. You know why? Because memories aren't created equal. You probably only saw one murder your whole life. You probably remembered it. How about you men in this room? It's not that, what is it, September? What did you do with your wives for Valentine's Day this year? Do you remember? Sadly, your wife doesn't even remember. That's even worse. But if you ask me, what did I do with my wife this year for Valentine's Day? I can't tell you. I've had 38 with her. I don't remember them all. But if you ask me, what did you do with your wife for Valentine's Day in 1988? <laughs> That's the day I married her. I remember that day, hour by hour, I can tell you the whole day. I won't miss much detail on that day because that Valentine's Day sticks out to me. It's not created equal to the other Valentine's Day. Look, do you guys hunt or fish out here anywhere? Is there good hunting and fishing out here? I bet there is. If I asked you, hey, do you fish? Yeah, I fish like every week, sometimes twice a week. Really? What was the fishing like on uh, December 12, 2011? I don't know. You don't remember, huh? No. You could fish every day and not remember all your fishing. But if there's a day you're out there fishing and a dude walks up to you on the water, you will remember that day. <laughs> so why do I think this, these details are probably pretty accurate? Because there was nobody else who did what Jesus did. That stuff's going to stick out in your head. We do make timelines in criminal cases to figure out if the murderer is available to do the crime. We're doing timelines here to figure out if these authors were available to write about Jesus. Let me move quickly. This next section I'm going to skip. We're running short of time. I'm sorry. I will send it to you. I think verification is important. And there is a ton of corroborative evidence, both archaeologically, both uh, first century authors who write about Jesus who are not even Christians. There's lots of stuff you can look at. I'm going to have to skip that right now. I will send it to you. This third section that was important to me, this is a guy we took to jail for no other reason other than he changed his story over time. And his story became more and more embellished. He killed his wife about, about 1981. If you change your story over time, there's a good chance you're lying to me. And that was my suspicion about the Gospels. You have this event, and then you have the council. I don't care how early it's written. How do I know that what I wrote is what made it into our Bible? How do I know it wasn't changed? The simple preaching rabbi called Jesus of Nazareth who never did a miracle, never walked on water, never rose from the grave, just a simple first century rabbi has been extrapolated and exaggerated into the Christ of Christianity from several changes in the original documents. That's the claim. You can see the same kind of thing could, be, uh, could happen at a criminal scene, right? I've got a crime scene. There's the courtroom. I'll put a piece of evidence in the crime scene. That's a casing, a bullet casing from a semi-automatic pistol. I'll bring it into court years later. I'll say, you know what? There's an extractor pin mark on that casing that demonstrates that this defendant's handgun was used in the crime because extractor pin marks make a relatively unusual mark on the casing, and sometimes they can be unique to the gun. And you can identify the casing to the gun. Really, Jim? How do I know that somebody didn't pull that out of property years later and 
etch in the extractor pin mark on the casing and put it back in property. Then they took it to the crime lab. They had no idea it had been tampered with. And they worked it like it was really legitimate evidence. They bring it to you years later. You had no idea that it had been changed earlier in history. Couldn't the same thing happen with one of the Gospels? Say like the Gospel of John. Okay, I have some Gospel of John. I don't care what it said originally. What it says now is not the same. Because we think it's been altered. How many times? I don't know. Ten? A hundred? A thousand? 10,000 times. It's got 300 years to be changed. By the time it finally gets into the council, these people are no more aware of the changes than you were. Do you see the problem here? Here's how we solve it. We ask this question. Hey, back in the day, was there an officer who was at the crime scene who saw that casing? Yeah. Did you take a picture of it? Like a Polaroid? You guys know what a Polaroid is? Okay, Polaroid test. Ready? Here we go. You guys know what? Fuji makes Polaroids now, right? Fuji cameras. Got it. This is how they look now. There it is. Wait, wait, wait. It develops right in front of your eyes. You've seen that one, right? Have you guys seen this one? Yeah, if you touch it, it'll mess it up. Now, who knows that camera? Who actually used that camera? Raise your hand. Less people. Older people. How about this? Yeah, they used to have a cover. Raise your hand if you use that one. Mm, how about this one? We used to put the solution on the Polaroid. Yeah. How many of you guys knew that one and used that one? Raise your hand. Keep your hands up. Let me see them. A few people we should be praying for. These are the walking dead, okay? <laughs> Seriously. These people could stroke out before the end of this service, so we'll be praying for you. Because you people are old. That was not nice. <laughs> All right. So then he's going to take that poll. He's probably also going to write a report, a supplemental report. All right. Where he's going to describe, hopefully, the extractor pin mark. I should be able to see it, hopefully, on the Polaroid. He's going to give it to another officer, a detective, probably. Back in those days, my dad would take what he would call an investigative supplemental. Because it would take weeks to get the 35 millimeter back. So he would take another Polaroid he could show to witnesses. And he would write his own report describing what he received. He'd take it to the crime lab. They would take uh, pictures. They would write a report about what they received. I finally pick it up. I write a report. Now I've got report after report after report. Picture after picture after picture to see if this casing is changing over the years. <clears throat> Pardon me. And every, every one of these people is like a link in the chain from the past to the present. That's why we call this the chain of custody. There's a chain of custody for the New Testament, too. You want to see it? Here's the crime scene. Here's the courtroom. First officer at the crime scene is a guy named John. He takes a picture of Jesus, writes a supplemental report. It's called the Gospel of John. But how do I know what's in it? Well, who's the next officer he gave it to? He gave it to three of his personal students, Ignatius, Polycarp, and Papias. These three students of John wrote down what John taught them. But how do I know what they said? If you didn't have John's gospel, you could just ask these guys, what did John teach you about Jesus? Is he less miraculous? Was he really born of a virgin? Are all those things there in the beginning, or are those not there? Well, lucky for us, these guys became leaders in the local churches. And we now have the documents that they wrote to local congregations. They are very ancient documents. They're not in your Bible. So we have seven letters from Ignatius in which he is describing what the eyewitnesses taught him because he had access to the eyewitnesses. And Papias, unfortunately, lost all of that work, but we do have one letter from Polycarp. If you want to know what John was teaching about Jesus, you could just ask his students. Now, these guys had a student, too. Ignatius and Polycarp had a student named Irenaeus, and he wrote a ton of stuff, and much of that survives. He even had a list of 24 New Testament books that he was using as his canon. Don't let anyone tell you the canon is invented at some church council. No. It's quoted immediately. I've shown you how many people quote different letters of Paul along the way, quote the scripture. And it's listed hundreds of years before any church council. The canon is not created by a council. The canon is simply confirmed. It's been in use for hundreds of years. Irenaeus had a student. His name was Hippolytus. He got in some trouble. He died in custody. I cannot find a student of Hippolytus, so my chain of custody is a little short here, but that's okay. What matters most in the chain of custody are the first links, right? If it hasn't changed from the beginning, you're okay in the middle. 
But I do have two other chains of custody I can show you in two entirely different regions of the world. Remember, that chain of custody is going uh, in one region of the world. That is going in Ephesus, in Asia Minor. This chain of custody from Paul to Tatian is in Rome. This chain of custody from Peter to Eusebius is in North Africa. What are they doing? They calling each other? Hey, what are you using down there? They Snapchatting each other? No. They're in different parts of the Roman Empire. And it turns out we have good data in all three regions. So if you lost all of your uh, Bible, all of the Gospels, and all you had were the first officers in the chain of custody, here's what you would know about Jesus. He'd be what? Simpler? No. Everything you know about Jesus from the virgin birth to all the miracles to the ascension into heaven to the seat at the right hand of the Father, all of that stuff is the first story and it never changes. Finally, we look at whether well, this is biased. Is somebody lying to us about this? Are they, are they motivated to lie? Are they so biased? Are they such a homer for Jesus that willing to say anything about him? Look, we have a bar at our city called the Crest. It's a biker bar. And if you go there on any Friday night, there's going to be a bar fight. I'm sure there was one there last night. And when we get those bar fight calls, we dispatch rookies because we want the rookie to see if he can handle a bar fight. And also to see if the rookie can figure out who the liar is because both of these guys are drunk and they want the other guy to go to jail. They claim the other guy started it. When that happens and you got two drunk, bar, uh, you know, two drunk guys at a bar fight, who goes to jail? Two drunk guys at a bar fight. That's right. Both of them go to jail. So it all comes down to learning what motivates people to lie. And there are only three reasons why anyone lies. They're the same three reasons why anyone commits a theft. The same three reasons why anyone commits a murder. The same three reasons why you have ever done anything you shouldn't do. Any sin you've ever committed. You only committed for one of these three reasons. Did you know that? And once you figure this out, you know how to help kind of protect yourself from sin as much as possible because you're never going to do that completely, of course. But I'm always looking for these three things. The three motives behind a murder. And they are simple. The first is just financial greed. People do lots of stupid things for money. And the second is kind of like it. It's sex relational or sexual lust. Usually more relational for women, usually more sexual for men. The third is more nuanced, and so I'm going to have to kind of explain it. It's the pursuit of power. If one gangster shoots another because he's been disrespected, what is that? Well, it's respect, authority. It's a subset of power. So things fall in this category a lot. Now, if you're suggesting that the disciples are lying about Jesus because they are biased, fine. That means they're motivated by one of these three things. So which is it? What, what is motivating the disciples? Is it their pursuit of all the cash? They were all died rich, right? Uh, no. They all died with an entire set of girlfriends, right? Uh, no. But you could argue, and many skeptics have, that they were motivated by the kind of a respect and authority that was given to them as leaders in a fledging, in a fledgling um, a religious community. You know, Peter was Peter. Paul was Paul. Well, okay, so Paul, who wrote more New Testament scripture than anyone else, Paul, you're telling me, is not motivated by money. He's not motivated by sex. He's motivated by power. That's right. He wants to be respected by his religious community. Well, wait a minute. Paul was already respected by his religious community. He says he was of the highest of the high. He was respected so much as a Jewish authority that he could draw papers to have Christians executed. He's out doing that work, and then one day you think, oh, you know what, I'm going to hop out of this position I have here, you know, of authority and power and respect. I'm going to hop in with these Christians. And I'm going to spend the next 25 years getting beat to death. Because <laughs> someday I hope to return to a position of power, authority, and respect. Really? That's possible. But it's not reasonable. If you were a religious leader in the first century, you were kind of like this deer, if you were a Christian. That's a bummer of a birthmark, Hal. <laughs> Christians had that thing on their forehead if you were a leader. You know what happened to these guys. You could end this story in the first century. You could end this mythology in the first century. Here's how you do it. You get the body of Jesus, you drag it around town. It's game over. No one becomes a Christian. Or you get one of these guys to recant. It wouldn't be that hard. We know that they were trying, but nobody ever recanted. Now look, you could say, Jim, I'm willing to die for what I believe is a Christian. So what? That has no evidential power. There are a lot of people who are willing to die for what they don't know is a lie. But you're not one of these 12. 
These are the one set of guys that would know if it's a lie. That's very different. Your death has no evidential value as far as making the case for Christianity, in my view. But the death of these guys, without ever recanting, that has huge evidential value. They're in a different category. Make sense? And they didn't have anything to gain. I want to just end with this last objection that is offered sometimes. Jim, if you want me to trust anything about Jesus, it has to be written by a non-Christian. Well, there's a lot of stuff I've got a list. It's actually an article on our website that called Evidence for Jesus Outside the Bible. It is the most popular. It's about 350,000 views so far. It's the most popular article on our website. Just they want to see, is there any non-Christian sources for Jesus? But the idea that I have to have a non-Christian source for Jesus is stupid. That means you just don't trust the Christian source. Why don't you trust the Christian source? Look, if you're working a robbery homicide, and there's no homicide today, you're going to work a robbery. I worked a lot of bank robberies. Here's a bank robbery. This picture was taken during a bank robbery. Now, it looks like it's just a regular transaction because he's already cleverly shown the gun and shown the demand note. So the, the teller knows this is a robbery. She's seen the gun and she's seen his note. So she is now giving him money. And from this point on, it looks pretty clever. You couldn't even tell it's a bank robbery, could you? Now, he's not that clever because when he walked in to do this, this robbery, he missed, he didn't look around very well. And behind the assistant manager's counter is a girl that he went to high school with. And she recognized him immediately. Now, as he, she's thinking to herself, well, he's, I'm going to say hello to him. Um, and I'll wait until he finishes his transaction, then I'll say hello. But now she looks up and her coworker has got a familiar look on her face, like she's seen it before. It is the look of, I'm being robbed. Push the alarm. I'm being robbed. Everyone's got an alarm button under their desk. And I can tell you that Kathy here, watching this, she is shocked that this guy she knew from high school is now doing a robbery. I know she is shocked because it says so right there. <laughs> now, she knew him for a long time. And he was very uh, well-respected in high school. And he was also the kind of person that... Um, she, if she would make a list of all the kind of people who would ever do a bank robbery, this guy would not even be on that list. That's why she's so shocked. But here he is. He's doing a bank robbery. I don't care what you knew about him. He's doing a bank robbery now. And she's known him for years. Do you think I should go interview her after the fact? Right? I mean, I, I could find her as a witness. I could say, hey, Kathy, tell me what happened. No. No, I can't interview her now because she is convinced that Robert Smith is a bank robber. She's biased. She's, she's biased. I mean, she, she thinks she's a bank robber. You might say she's a Robert Smithian. You can't trust Robert Smithians, people who think that Robert Smith is a bank robber. You can't trust them to tell you the truth about Robert Smith. Do you see how stupid this is? She is not convinced that Robert Smith is a bank robber based on some preconceived bias. She, is, she believes this because she saw it with her own eyes. That's a very different position to be in. I think she's very well qualified to be an eyewitness here and to testify in this case. How is she any different, though, than, say, someone like Matthew? You think Matthew is a friend of Jesus? He's not a friend of any of the disciples. He wasn't. You know, a lot of the disciples of Jesus were previously the disciples of John the Baptist. They had known each other for years. That's not true for Matthew. Matthew's a dude named Levi, who's a tax collector, who comes into the game late. Jesus says, hey, come with me. Three years of watching that stuff with Jesus, he's like, I'm in. I'm one of you guys now. He writes a gospel. If you're looking for the one written record of the person who was not a disciple, who wasn't expecting the Messiah, who was the skeptic, that's called the gospel of Matthew. Now, we started off looking at this guy. We said, hey, can you trust what this guy's doing? Can you trust his story? Not really. We've got good reason not to trust him. Now we're going to take that same approach, a cumulative circumstantial approach to whether or not we can trust what the Gospels say about Jesus. We build it on four legs. The first is, is it early enough to have actually been written by eyewitnesses and fact-checked by those who also know the truth? I think we've got good reason to believe this is an early document. That's a reasonable inference. Also, we didn't talk about any of the corroboration. I love that. That's that 17-hour class I teach at Biola. Sorry, I cannot cover that with you today. But I will send it to you. 
Third thing we cover is whether or not this has changed over time. I think we've got good reason to believe it has not changed over time. Finally, there's the issue of whether or not they're lying based on a bias or based on a desire or a motive to lie. And I think there's good reason to reject that. Now, do you see what we just did? It's death by a thousand paper cuts. That's why when people ask me, Jim, why are you a Christian? I typically say, well, you got two hours? Because it's going to take me two hours to tell you that. Because I can't make this case briefly. The way I couldn't make it, tell, tell me why you think this guy killed his wife. Well, you got two hours. Here's my case book. Dunk. We start going through that case book together. That's what this requires. I can't do this on Twitter. I can't do this on Facebook. I don't even try to do it in Twitter and Facebook. You really want to know? Write to me. Call me. This is not a conversation we can have in 140 characters. Does that make sense? So when people ask me all the time, Jim, why are you a Christian? I typically say I'm not a Christian because it works for me. Because it doesn't work for me. This is probably, this is not an easy worldview to hold in 2017. It'll be much harder to hold in 2018. If you haven't been paying attention, you realize that the culture now rejects almost entirely the moral teaching of our master. You realize that, right? And make no mistake about it, if they reject the teaching of our master, they are rejecting our master. It's not going to be able to say, oh, I like Jesus. I just hate what he stood for. Think about it. Now, my wife and I were together for 18 years before either one of us became a Christian. We've been together about 20 since. If you ask Susie which 18 or 20 years was easier, she'll tell you the first. It's so easy to throw the dart against the wall and just draw the bullseye around wherever the dart lands. If you asked me back in those days, how's life going for you guys? Awesome. Well, how do I know? Because you just asked me. I'm the only final judge of how my life is right now. I think my life is great. That's the way life used to be for us. It wasn't about putting my, I was always putting us first. Me first. That was how most of us live. Think about it. As a cop, who's the last? Look, you called me to this to solve this problem, right? So you're going to listen to what I tell you. I'm not listening to what you tell me. I didn't call you. You called me. That is the attitude the most patrol officers have. I had it for years. No one was going to tell me how to do something. So I'm not a Christian because it works for me in that sense. I'm also not a Christian because I was raised in a Christian family because I wasn't. I'm not a Christian because I was hoping for heaven or afraid of hell. Those things just don't animate me. They just don't. If, if Christianity taught that we're dead and we're in the dirt the next day, I'm okay with that. That's what I always thought anyway. I'm glad it's not the case, but I'm just saying that was not my motivation. And I'm not a Christian because I was trying to fix my screwed up life. We didn't have a bad life. We had a great life. I am a Christian because it is true. That's it. Pretty simple, huh? And if you ask me, I can tell you more than what my Mormon family can tell you about Mormonism because you could not do this with Mormonism. I tried. I was hoping Mormonism was true because I was an atheist wanting to be part of, you know, I wanted to know what is the truth. Is it Mormonism or Christianity? It's not Mormonism. Now, I'm going to send you everything you need to make this case. Are you ready to write it down? You have to go to one place to get it. You can't type it in Google. It's a hidden page I have designed just for you guys to get these materials. I wish I had a slide. Somehow it's not in my set. I apologize. You ready? You're going to go to coldcasechristianity.com forward slash resources. It's a hidden page. Cold Case Christianity, no hyphens, no spaces, coldcasechristianity.com forward slash resources, plural, and you'll be able to download everything and keep it. Use it. I'll tell you what, don't download it unless you're going to use it. Talk is cheap. You know who said that? King Solomon said that. So that's a biblical notion. We've got to stop talking about Oh, well, someday I'm going to study that stuff. Someday I'm going to be equipped to do what Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, to be able to give the hope for the reason I have. Today is that day. Let's pray. Father, I know that I can be, um, I can be lazy. And I know that I can be um, a bit lethargic, especially during football season or during 
those times when I get distracted by other stuff. I, I, you know it already, Father. You know what I was doing last night. You know what games I was watching. I could be spending that time some other way. Father, just help us to prioritize you, to actually live our life as though we worship you, to live our life as though you are more important than anything else. Help us to do that, Father, in a, a, a culture of utter distraction. Help us to be undistracted. We love you. We want to become the people you want us to become. Motivate us, Father, to know why this is true so that we can share it with a lost world. And we pray this in the name of your precious son, Jesus Christ. And everyone here says, have a wonderful Sunday. You are now free to go.